Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another Thursday night psalm study. And we are on Psalm 99. And we are on part one of the psalm study and I titled the study this week, Crediting Righteousness to Yourself. There's a question. And so uh, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we could come together and study your word. Lord, we ask that as we study your word tonight that you would speak to our hearts. You help us to bring glory to your name by the way we live our lives, Lord. And we ask that you would help us to um, overcome sin in our lives, Lord. And uh, we just give you praise, Lord. We thank all these things that you've done for us and blessed for us, blessed us, Lord. And we just thank these things in Yeshua's name. Oh, Amen. Okay, so um, Psalm 99 and so let me read through the psalm, and I uh, have the link on matsadi.com if you're uh, wanting to follow along. And so down on page 2, Psalm 99 has only nine verses, and so let me read through that. It says the following, it says, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies in the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You are forgiving God to them, and yet an avenger of their evil deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for holy is the Lord our God. Okay, so uh, we're down on page 3. And in this week's study from the Psalm 99, the psalm opens and it says in verse 1, it says that the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. Okay, so in this psalm, David speaks of the authority and the power of God, the people trembling in his dwelling above the cherubim. Why does the psalmist speak of our Father dwelling above the cherubim? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever wondered about that? And there are various references in the scriptures that speak of the Lord who dwells above the cherubim, such as what we find in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, Isaiah 37, verse 16, and Isaiah 40, verse 22. And you can see on page 3, I quoted those scriptures. It says the following. It says in Exodus 25, verse 22, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are, are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in the commandment for the sons of Israel. And in Isaiah 37, verse 16, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have, been, you have made heaven and earth. And in Isaiah 40, verse 22, it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants, inhabitants are grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads, spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Okay, so according to the Torah, God's presence is located between the two cherubim over the mercy seat. There, the Lord God would meet with his people to speak there unto them, as it says in Exodus 29, verse 42. And the special seat of the divine presence was to be the empty space above the mercy seat between the two cherubim and above the Ark of the Covenant. And this may be where David received his Torah-based understanding on the Lord who reigns. The people tremble and the Lord as being enthroned above the cherubim. Isaiah states something similar of the Lord being enthroned above the cherubim and in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 22 mm -hmm. it parallels the earth and the tent mm -hmm. of the heavens as being a dwelling place which alludes to the Ohel Moed. The word cherubim is described in the two books of the Tanakh, in Genesis and in Ezekiel. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, the cherubim guard the Garden of Eden 
following Adam and Eve's banishment from the garden and are described as holding flaming swords. And then in Ezekiel, it speaks of the cherubim in the following way. And I quote from Ezekiel chapter 1 through 4, chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. And that says the following at the bottom of page 3. It says, Now it came about in the thirtieth year on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river of Kedar, or Kebar, among the exiles, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river of Kedar, or Kebar. And there the hand of the Lord came upon him. And as I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it, and in its midst something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet were like calf's hoofs and they gleamed like burnishing bron burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, were human hands, and as for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn. When they moved, each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above, each had two touching another being, and two covering their bodies, and each went straight forward, wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go, without turning as they went. And in the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran, ran to and fro like bolts of light, lightning. And in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 22 to 24, Now over the heads of the living beings there was something like an expanse, like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. And under the expanse their wings were stretched out straight, one towards the other. Each one also had two wings covering its body, on the one side and on the other. And all, I also heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, a sound of tumult like the sound of an army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. Ezekiel 10, verse 3 to 8. Now the cherubim were standing on the right side of the temple when the man entered, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim, the cherub, to the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Moreover, the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks it came about when he commanded the man clothed in linen saying take fire from between the whirling wings or whirling wheels from between the cherubim he entered and stood beside a wheel then the cherub stretched out his hand from between the cherubim to the fire which was between the cherubim took some and put it into the hands of the one clothed in linen he, he took it and went out the cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under their wings. Okay, and then Ezekiel 10, verse 12, 14, and 20 through 22. It says, Their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and their wheels were full of eyes all around, the wheels belonging to the, all four of them. And then 14, And each one had four faces. The, face, the first face was the face of a cherub, the second face the face of a man, the third face the face of a lion, the fourth face of an eagle and in verses 20 to 22 these are the living beings that I saw beneath the God of Israel by the river of Kebar so then so I knew they were cherubim each one had four faces and each one four wings and beneath their wings was a form of human hands as for the likeness of their faces they were the same faces whose appearance I had seen by the river Kebar each one went straight ahead okay so Ezekiel describes the cherubim as being in the presence and the glory of God. And Ezekiel's vision describes the cherubim as having six wings. They function as part of holding up the temple in heaven. And the text describes the glory of God as going up from the cherubim. And in Ezekiel 10 verse 20, it describes the cherubim as being beneath the Lord in heaven, which suggests that the Lord is above 
the Lord is the one who is to be worshipped and praised above all things, everything takes second seat, a position below the Lord God, our Father in heaven. Now, looking in the rabbinic literature, in the Talmud Bavli, in, in Talmud Bavli, in Bava Batra 99a, it describes the cherubim on the Keparet as being able to move according to the obedience of the children of Israel. And according to the Talmud, it says, but in another verse, Second Chronicles 3.13, it says, they face the walls of the room. When the people of Israel filled God's, fulfilled God's will, the cherubim would face one at each other. And when the people of Israel did not fulfill God's word or will, the cherubim would face the walls of the room. Okay, so that was the rabbi's interpretation. And while trying to understand what is meant by the cherubim facing each other, where at times they faced the walls, depending on the people's sin, think of the times when you were able to face someone else you were close to and times when you needed to face away. And what allows, what is, the question is, what allows us to face someone as opposed to what would cause one to turn away? Well, what would allow one to face someone would be that companionship, peace, love, you know, between one another, etc. As opposed to what causes one to turn away would be shame. And shame causes us to turn our faces away from one another. And in a similar manner, the Talmud describes the cherubim taking this approach as being ashamed and facing away from one another when the people would sin. So when the people sinned, and a cherubim faced away from one another, they did, did not function on the keparet in the fashion that the Lord had wanted. And so the presence of God would leave. And when the people repent and turn from their sins, the cherubim are said to turn back facing one another, and then the presence of God returns, and um, the tabernacle would function in the manner in which the Lord had designed. And so the concept here is that repentance is a very important aspect of our faith and that we are to um, daily repent and turn from our sins and um, if, if we commit one and um, that is what the Lord wants for in our, life, in our lives. Now, uh, Rambam, in his commentary on the guide for the perplexed, has the following to say concerning the Ezekiel account of the cherubim. And so on page 5, I quote, of the guide to the perplexed part 3 chapter 1 part 1 it says it is well known that there are men whose face is like that of other animals and thus the face of some person is like that of a lion and that of another person is like that of an ox and so on and man's face is described according according as the form of his face resembles the form of the face of other animals and by the expression it's the face of an ox the face of a lion the face of an eagle, the prophet describes a human face inclining towards the forms of these various species. This interpretation can be sort of supported by two pro proofs. First, the prophet says of the Hayot in general that their appearance is this, they have the form of a man. And then in describing each of the Hayot, he ascribes to them the face of uh, a man. Let's see the face of a ox and a lion and an eagle. And secondly, in the description of the chariot, which is intended as a supplement to the first, the prophet says, each hath four faces. The one is the face of a cherub, the second a, fa a man's face, the third a lion's face, and the fourth that of an eagle. And he thus clearly indicates that, that, that the terms, the face of an ox, the face of a cherub, are identical. But cherub describes a youth. And by analogy, we explain the two other terms, the face of a lion and the face of an eagle, in the same manner. The face of an ox has been singled out on account of the etymology of the word of the term shore. Ox, as has been indicated by me. And it is impossible to assume that this second description refers to the perception of another prophetic vision because it concludes thus, this is the Haya, Haya which I saw at the river Kebar which we intended to explain. What we intended to explain is now clear. Okay, so that was Rambam's commentary, and, and Rambam states that the cherubim, according to Ezekiel, had the appearance of a man, but their faces resembled a particular animal. And these cherubim 
inclined towards the appearance of a particular animal in the sense that there is a particular attribute the vision is attempting to ascribe to each of the four cherubim that were seen in the vision. The ox and the lion have strength and authority. The eagle soars high above and the man was created and man was created as a crown of God's creation having rule over all of the creatures. And so the description then of the glory of God ascending from the cherubim into the throne room, if we were able to find a parallel here in the context of these angels created in the image of God in the form of a man but having a likeness of an ox, a lion, and an eagle and man suggests that the manner in which these angels live having been given power from on high. And so the ox represents strength, the lion authority, the eagle in the heights, and the man as the crown of God's creation. And this seems to be an allusion to what the Lord has done for man, creating us in his image with authority and power over this earth. And when we study Torah and apply it to our lives, we soar above the nations and yet we are men who are designed to live out our lives bringing glory to God. And so the Lord has endowed these angels with great power just as he has enabled us, giving us the power to make wealth, you know, as it says in Parashat Ekev, according to Deuteronomy 8.18. And we recognize the source of our abilities and then we give credit to the Lord God in heaven. So we are giving credit to the Lord and to whom credit is due. And this is the manner in which the cherubim functioned. They are creatures of great power and authority, and yet their lives are directed to the lifting up and the bringing glory and honor and praise unto the Lord God, our Father in heaven. And in a similar manner, we too are to bring glory and honor and praise unto the Lord God, our Father in heaven, by the way that we live our lives. Now David in this psalm, he continues, and he says in verse 2 and 3, The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Okay, so reading through these psalms, what does it mean that the Lord is great in Zion? What does that mean? And why are the people called out to praise his name? Now, Radak who was another Jewish commentator. He was a medieval rabbi, biblical commentator, philosopher, and grammarian. And he has the following to say concerning the Lord being great in Zion. In Radak on Psalm 99, part two, or verse 2, part 1, he says, The Lord is great in Zion, and then he will be great in Zion because there he will be magnified above all the nations when he executes judgment on the wicked. And in the Midrash, Shachar Tov, it says the Lord is great in Zion when he returns his presence to Zion. In that moment, he is great. Okay, so note that Radak believes the phrase the Lord is great in Zion is referring, referring to his being glorified in Zion above the nations in the sense that he brings judgment upon the wicked. A midrash on this phrase states that the returning of his presence in Zion is what makes him great. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Now, the reason may be that the Lord is actively working in men's heart to turn from sin and to walk in his ways. And his presence is dependent upon our seeking him in his ways. In his presence, returning to Zion suggests that Israel has repented and turned from her sins and are seeking the Lord God for his help. Just as the uh, earlier Rebbein commentary that we had read from the Talmud where the cherubim face one another when Israel is obedient to God's commands, they face away in shame when Israel is disobedient to the commands. Now, Radak, he continues, he says the following in his commentary on Psalm 87 verse 2 part 1. He says, The Lord loves the gates of Zion. It says gates because the elders and the wise sit in the gates, as it says, up to the gate to the elders. And so too, in the words of Boaz, who described the elders who were at the gate. 
even though God loves all the dwelling places of Jacob, as it says, How God goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. Nevertheless, he loves the gates of Zion more, because there the wise are occupied with the service of God. Okay, so Radak states that the greatness of God in Zion is related to the elders who sit at the gates of Zion. Those who sit at the gate are concerned with what is going on in the city. And so when we look at the word gates in the Hebrew language, shirim, in the Tanakh, the word gates are used, gates is used in various ways. You know, one, a gate is a function as a, gates function as a defense against the enemy. Two, the word gate may refer to an entire city and to the rulers or city of a, or army of a city. And in Deuteronomy 16, verse 5, it says that you are not allowed to sacrifice a Passover in any of your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you. And note in the Hebrew text, in the, in the uh, Masoretic text, it says gates is translated as towns in the English. But we find the word shear as referring to the gate rather than, you know, town. And so the idea here is that the city gate is a place where the Lord is forbidding this uh, sacrifice of the Passover from being slaughtered, and therefore that the city gate is a place of power and authority. And if we look in Parashat Vayishlach in Genesis 32 to 36, this offers some additional insights into the importance of the city gates. The Lord gives Jacob a new name, Israel, and Jacob returns to Eretz Canaan and he settles in the land. And while in the land, Jacob settles down near the town or the city of Shechem and in Genesis 33, verse 18. And so while dwelling near Shechem, according to the scriptures, Shechem, the son of Hamor, sees Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and desires to take her as a wife. And we read according to Genesis 34, verses 1 through, through 8, it says the following. It says, Now Dina... The daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. He was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, and saying, Give me this young girl for a wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent until they came in. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, and they were very angry because they had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Okay, so... The sons of Jacob tell Shechem and Hamor that if they are circumcised, they will exchange their sons and daughters, and they will be one people. And so hearing this, Hamor and his son Shechem go to the city gate, and they tell the men of the city what they want to do to be circumcised. And notice how this may be paralleled to the conversion and circumcision of entering into the kingdom of God. And so Abraham was giving the, given the promises of God prior to being circumcised, he believed by faith and then lived out his life according to the meat's boat and the, the hukim of God. On the other hand, these men at Shechem were involving themselves in a conversion ritual in order to become a part of Israel or to become, quote, acceptable so they could take part in the blessings of God, but more likely their motivations were driven by greed and covetousness. And so the people of Shechem died because of their sins and their lack of faith and their reliance upon a conversion ritual to enter into the family of God. And this is what the apostles were afraid of or would, were afraid would happen with the new Gentile believers according to Acts chapter 15. So it is then written that all of the city agreed and in the act of desiring to acquire all of Israel's wealth. So it, it, it appears that according to the Torah that all of the men in Shechem were circumcised. And we read in Genesis 34, verse 24 to 26, it says, 
all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Now it came about on the third day, when they were in pain, that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares, and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword, and took Dina from Shechem's house and went forth. Okay, so based upon this context, the gate of the city was known biblically as a place of power. The one who controls the gate is the one who has the power to allow someone in or out of the city. So sitting at the gates enabled one to know everything that was going on in the city, especially that of a walled city. And in God's kingdom, the gate is the only way whereby we gain access to the Lord. Yeshua said in John chapter 10, verse 1, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Yeshua then states in John 10 verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. And in John 14 verse 6, Yeshua answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes, no one comes to the Father except through me. Note that these men of Shechem were following this gate analogy, but were trusting in their ritual conversion as opposed to trusting the Lord God of Israel. And in the context of the New Testament, in Yeshua the Messiah. And in Parashat Vayishlach, all of the men who entered in and went out through the gate of the city needed to be circumcised according to the agreement. And similarly, today, we must have circumcised hearts in order to enter in through the gates to the kingdom of heaven. And this is accomplished by faith in God's gatekeeper, Yeshua the Messiah. These scriptures direct us to the true gate, the door, the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Lord our Father who is in heaven. And this is the significance of Radak's statement of the Lord who loves the gates of Zion. Because the elders and the wise who sit in this place of authority, the righteous who seek to counsel the Lord for their judgments. And note, again, the righteous seek the counsel of the Lord and trust in Him, whereas the unrighteous trust in themselves or in some deed which they count to themselves as merit. Okay, so the book of Ruth, in chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Now, my daughters, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. And note again in the Masoretic text that they, the English translators equate the word for gate, Sha'ar, with city. They translate it as city. In Isaiah 14, verse 31, it also equates gate with city. In, in these various instances, the noun is used as a substitute for something with which it is closely associated. And Take, for example, Psalm 24, verse 7, that states, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Whereas the Septuagint translates, it says, Lift up your gates, O rulers. And here, the rulers of the city control the gates, and therefore the gates refer to the, the city. And so the power and protection of the city is found in the gate. And if we keep this in mind, looking at Judges chapter 16, verses 1 to 3, it says the following. It says on page uh, 8 of the study, it says, Now Samson, Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went to her. When it was told to the Gazites, saying, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. And they kept silent all night, saying, Let us wait until the morning light, then we will kill him. Now Samson lay until midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the city gate and the two po posts, and pulled them up along at, with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain, which is opposite of Hebron. Okay, so according to Judges chapter 16, verses 1 to 3, the men of the city were laying in wait for Samson to kill him at the gate of the city, which illustrates the strength of that city. Samson rose at midnight and took the city gate and carried them to the top of the mountain. Samson was making a show of his strength and the empowering of God and how their strength was nothing compared to the Lord's power. Now, Radak 
He also has the following to say on Psalm 83, 87, verse 3, part 1. He says, glorious things, this means glorious attributes, and is speaking of those that inhabit you. Or its explanation is that glorious virtues will be attributed to you, that you are elevated over all lands in many things. The settled world is divided into seven portions, and Jerusalem is in the center portion, which is in, which is in the center of the civilized world. Thus it says, dwelling on the navel of the earth. Therefore its air is good, mingled with from all airs, good for the health of the body and wisdom, as is said, the fairest of branches, the joy of the entire earth. And our sages say, the air of the land of Israel makes one wise. Okay. So note how Radak connects the glorious things to those who inhabit the city. He speaks of the glorious virtues which are attributed to the people who are the sons of God by the way the Lord has worked in their lives and how they live their lives for the Lord God of Israel. And this has the effect of elevating the people above the nations. Jerusalem is considered at the center of the civilized world because of the attributes of God in his ways, which is the Torah. Men do not run amok with wickedness, but are commanded to do good to one another, to help a brother, and to love their neighbor in God. It is for these things that the Lord is praised, and we are called to give praise unto the Lord God in heaven because of what he has done and who he is. This is how David explain, explains these things according to the psalm. And he says in Psalm 99, verse 4, The strength of the, of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Now note, in the Masoretic text it writes, Ata asita, meaning that you have done, as a reference to the Lord causing righteousness and justice to be found in Israel. And because the Lord brings righteousness and holiness and justice with him and gives these things to his people. And it's for this reason we are called exalt we are called to in Psalm ninety nine verse five to exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for holy is he. Now the Aramaic Targum it states on verses four through five it says that and you love the strength of the king of justice, you have established integrity you have made justice and righteousness in Jacob. Sing praise in the presence of the Lord our God and bow down towards his sanctuary. He is holy. And so the rabbis translate the Masoretic text to say that the Lord makes justice and righteousness in Israel and we sing in the presence of the Lord bowing towards his sanctuary which is considered synonymous to uh, the bowing down at his footstool. Now David he continues in the psalm. He says in verses 6 through 7, Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies in the statute that he gave them. Okay, so he speaks, David speaks of the Torah account of Moshe and Aaron calling upon the name of the Lord, exalting his name. And note how Targum translates this verse to say, Moses and Aaron are among his priests who gave their life for the people of the Lord. And Samuel prayed for them before the Lord like the fathers of old who prayed in his name. They would pray in the presence and he would answer them. In the pillar of the glorious clouds he would speak with them. They kept the commandments of his testimony and the covenant that he gave to them. Okay, so the Targum translates Moshe and Aaron giving their lives to the people. What does that mean? You know, how, how did they give their lives to the people? And so the classical commentators have the following to say concerning the meaning of Moshe and Aaron giving their lives to the people. In Akedat Yitzchak in 88.14 it states, Our conduct vis-a-vis -vis -vis God is based on the very same principles. Some people expect God to do their bidding, relying on their merit and presenting their claim to God. Once these merits have been exhausted, they appear before God, pleading their case through prayer. Concerning these two groups of people, the psalmist says, Moshe and Aaron of his priests, and Samuel, who called on his name, meaning the former have deeds to their credit, the latter employed the venue of prayer. Okay, so, Akedat Yitzchak 
states that there are certain principles of the faith that people used to get the Lord to do their bidding. And these principles he is speaking of is related to living and striving for righteousness, which is credited as merit in the sense that by doing what is right, the Lord has no reason to turn away from answering one's prayer. One could go further to say that Akidat Yitzchak could be speaking of the person who believes that by his own merits the Lord should answer his prayer and that the, the point is is that it is our it is, okay it is the mercy of God by which we receive an answer to prayer and it is our seeking the Lord God to overcome sin I believe that in, in this context that repentance is absolutely necessary as a part of and parcel to our receiving an answer to prayer. And this principle that Radak is speaking, or no, Akidat Yitzhak is speaking of, is related to living and striving for righteousness, which is then credited as merit. And the idea is that we are striving for righteousness, not for the sake of justifying ourselves, but for the sake of our love for the Lord God in heaven who first loved us, you know, and he has, he entered into a covenant with us and we with him. And as a result of his redeeming power, as a result of his saving power, that we live our lives for him and then he empowers us to do so. And so all the credit ultimately goes to the Lord God in heaven who in and of himself creates and puts within our hearts a desire to live for him and Moshe and Aaron are said to have this kind of credit to their account when going before the Lord on behalf of the people in prayer now Shnei Luchot explains um, in Torah or uh, the further the meaning of these verses and so in uh, in Shnei Luchot Habrit Korach in Parashat Korach and Torah Or 71, it says that I have explained already that these three virtues had to be practiced both vis-a-vis -vis God and vis-a-vis -vis man. And this is the meaning, and you will find favor and high esteem in the eyes of God. That is what is meant that Samuel was good to God and to men. And this also explains what Hannah meant when she prayed to God that she that he should grant her um, a zera anashim, which our sages, sages explain to mean that she asked for a son who would combine with himself the virtues of Moshe and Aaron. We also find in, in 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 11, we also find that Moshe and Aaron are compared to Samuel in Psalm 99 6. Moshe and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among those who call on his name and he answers them. Okay, so that was Shnei Luchot. Habrit in Torah Or. And Shnei Luchot um, states that there are virtues that are to be practiced by both the Lord God in heaven and by man. The practice of righteousness on God's behalf is connected to his mercy and to the psalm saying that the Lord will make righteousness and justice to prevail in Israel. These virtues are given to man from God and then man is to have faith in the God of Israel and to walk in his ways based on this faith and then practice righteous living. You know, that that is what we are called who we are called to be. Okay, and so the next commentator is by Sephorno on Deuteronomy thirty two verse three part one. Sephorno says, If this is as I said, then you, Israel, who have received these words of wisdom, will appreciate that the thrust of my address is a prayer. A prayer that all of us, including myself, will experience the ultimate redemption after the last exile. Moshe includes this in his preamble in order to make sure that his listeners will not fail to see the forest by connecting it or by concentrating too much on the individual trees. Our author first proceeds to quote examples such as formulations as Moshe uses here, meaning prayer. He, we find in Lamentations 355, I have called on your name from the depths of the pit. Clearly, Jeremiah refers to his prayer. We read in Jeremiah 99.6, oh, sorry, in Psalm 99.6, concerning the trio of Moshe, Aaron, and Samuel, that they were known as that whenever they prayed to God, he would respond to them favorably. 
Moshe then therefore tells the people, when I pray for the ingathering, the exiles, I want God to orchestrate this so that it is like the eagle rousing his young and carrying them to a new destination on the, destination on the back of his wings. Moshe continues, focusing in his prayer on the arrival of the Messiah by saying, God will do this on all on his own without anyone's assistance. And at the very end of his shira, he explains which is equivalent this he these Hebrew words which is equivalent to the instruction in our verse saying, Render glory to the Lord our God. Okay, so Sephorno opens with the word Kishem Adonai Akra, meaning that I will call upon the name of the Lord. And he connects this to receiving the words of wisdom of Torah and the redemption of his people from exile. The redemption of God is based upon the Lord God of Israel and not upon the people. And this is described as Moshe Aaron, and Aaron going before the Lord in prayer, saying, when I pray for the ingathering of the exiles, I want God to orchestrate this so that it is like the eagle rousing his young and carrying them to a new destination on his back. And so both Moshe and Aaron go before the Lord with their own lives in their hands and seek the counsel of God on behalf of the people. And this, the nature of this counsel is to seek the Lord himself to carry his people to safety, to deliver his people. So Moshe and Aaron are essentially, they're calling upon the mercy and the grace of God to save his people. Now Sephorno states that Moshe continues focusing in his prayer on the arrival of the Messiah by saying that God will do this on his own without anyone's assistance. So salvation and redemption coming at the hand of the Messiah is a function of the Lord God alone. The Lord answered their prayers and it is for this reason glory and praise are rendered unto the Lord according to the psalm. Now the next commentator is Rashi. In Rashi on Numbers chapter 16 verse 7 part 1 he says he says that it is a great and important thing that I have told you, you sons of Levi. But were they not fools, in that although he so sternly warned them, they nevertheless undertook to offer? They, however, sinned against their own souls. They were regardless of their lives, as is said, the censors of these sinners against their souls. But Korach, who certainly was a clever, open-eyed man, what reason had he to commit his, this folly? His mind's eye misled him. He saw by prophetic vision a line of great men uh, descending from him amongst them the prophet Samuel, who was equal in importance to Moshe and Aaron together. And he said to himself, On this account I shall escape the punishment. And he further saw twenty-four mishmars, or shifts of Levite, Levites who formed the temple choir, arising among his grandchildren, all of them prophesying by the Holy Spirit. As is said, First Chronicles chapter 25, verse 5, all these Prominent musicians were the sons of Haman. Haman was a descendant of Korach, according to First Chronicles chapter six, verse eighteen to twenty-three. He said, "It is possible that all this indignity is to arise from me, and I shall remain silent, be myself of no importance." And so, on this account, he joined the others in order to attain to that prerogative, because he had indeed heard from the mouth of Moses that all else of them would perish, and one would escape. He whom the Lord will choose will be holy. He mistakenly applied this to himself, but he had not seen correctly, for his sons repented of their rebellious attitude and therefore did not die at that time. And it was from them that Samuel and the Le Levitical singers were descended. Moshe, however, foresaw, foresaw this. Okay, so Rashi contrasts sin to the righteousness of God Men credit to themselves righteousness by their deeds and mislead themselves to believe that the Lord will work to their benefit because of their deeds. Rashi says that the correct perspective is to rely upon the Lord for the accreditation of righteousness. Paul agrees, saying in Romans chapter 4, verse 24, But also for us to whom God will accredit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So we believe in our Father in heaven the Lord God of Israel, who raised Yeshua to life from the dead, having faith in this powerful work of, of uh, the Messiah, causes one to receive the righteousness of God. And so living our lives by faith, 
causes righteousness to be accredited to our lives by the way that we live. Okay, so then the next commentary is from uh, Derashot Haran, 9, verse 10, part 10. It says, It is nonetheless true, however, that the greater the man, the less he requires of such meditation, and the lesser the man, the more, less refined meditation he requires. This is what was in, intimated by Moses, our father, may peace be upon him, in his, this Parsha. Deuteronomy 4.11, And you drew near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the heart of heaven, darkness, cloud, and mist. The last three words are stressed to inform them that the confusion of the divine effluence at that exalted encounter required in point of their frailty many meditating agents tending to thickness. And this is the intent of the numeration, darkness, cloud, and mist. The duplication here stresses the grossness of the mediating agents, and all this was needed for Israel, but not for Moses. For though when the blessed one spoke with Moses, there was a pillar of cloud between them, as indicated by the plain meaning of the verse, Exodus 33, verse 9, and it was when Moses came to the tent that a pillar of cloud descended and stood at the entrance of the tent. In Psalm 99, verse 6 through 7, Moshe and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. In a pillar of cloud he spoke to them. These verses seeming to indicate that the Most High converse with Moshe was mediated by a pillar of cloud. Still, even if we say that this was so, this mediation was not so gross as to be referred to as darkness, cloud, and mist. The latter variety was necessitated by the relative frailty of Israel. Okay, so Derashot Haran speaks of the greater and the lesser meditation on behalf of the one who sins. The commentary goes on to stress of the significance of the word wording in Deuteronomy 4 verse 11 under the descriptions of the mountain of Sinai that the mountain burned with fire unto the heart of the heaven, darkness, cloud, and mist. These things separated man from the Lord God in heaven. Even Moshe was separated by the pillar, indicated by the meaning of Exodus 33, verse 9. The cloud stood at the entrance to the tent, standing in between them, as he called upon the name of the Lord. And this occurred for Moshe, Aaron, and Samuel, all who called upon the Lord, and he answered them from the cloud. The Lord worked in this way because of the frailty of Israel, because of her sins. The people need a mediator, and this was the reason the Torah speaks prophetically of another mediator coming, of a Messiah, Messiah, greater than Moshe. This Messiah is described according to Hebrews in the following way. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, and he is the radiance of his glory in the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, so both Moshe, Aaron, and Samuel bore the testimony of God by the way that they lived their lives. Yeshua the Messiah also bore the testimony of God. And according to Hebrews, he is the radiance of the glory of God. And the rabbinic commentary also states that it is in a similar manner that we take on the glory of God, according to the Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, chapter 3, part 2. It says, Rabbi Hanani, the deputy high priest, says, Pray for the welfare of the government, for were it not for the fear of it, men would swallow, man would swallow his fellow alive. Rabbi Hanani, son of Teradion, says, Two who are sitting together, and there are no words of Torah spoken between them. This is a session of scorners, as is said in Psalm 1.1. Happy is a man who has not sat in a session of the scorners. But two who are sitting together, and there are words of Torah that are spoken between them. The divine presence rests with them, as it is said um, in Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke one with another, and the Lord hearkened and heard and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and for those who thought upon his name. I have no scriptural support for this except for in a case of two. For where is there proof that even when there is only one person studying Torah, 
the Holy One, blessed be he, determines to reward a reward for him. As it said in Lamentations 3.28, he sits alone and is silent since he takes a reward for it. Since he takes a reward for it. Okay, so this is from the Mishnah in the Pirkei Avot. And the, Pirkei, and the Mishnah states that when two sit together speaking and discussing God's word, the glory of God descends upon them in God's presence is in their midst. The Apostle Peter had very similar conclusions with regard to being reviled for the sake of the name of the Messiah. And you find in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, it says, If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God, of God rests on you. Okay, so the, we find a very similar parallel here to the rabbinic literature here, right in what, with regard to what Peter is writing in his epistle. Now the Targum translates that Moshe and Aaron gave their lives to the people and Samuel prayed for the people where all three prayed in various instances in an intercessory manner. And so it says in the Targum, Moshe and Aaron are among his priests who gave their life for the people of the Lord and Samuel prayed for them before the Lord like the fathers of old who prayed in his name. They would pray in his presence and he would answer them. In the pillar of glorious clouds he would speak with them. They kept the commands of his testimony and a covenant that he gave to them. Okay, so what we find is that they bore, according to the psalm, in, in, the, mid, in the Torah, or sorry, in the, in the Targum, um, and yes, yeah, from the Torah, that they bore the testimony of God by keeping the ways of God in their lives and encouraging people to do the same. So in essence, they functioned as a type of Messiah in the sense of living for the Lord and guiding the people to seek the Lord God in heaven in his ways. David, in his psalm, he concludes, he says, verse 8 and 9, O Lord our God, you answered them. You were forgiving God, or forgiving God and yet an avenger of their evil deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for holy is the Lord our God. Okay, so David says, that the Lord answered in the manner of forgiveness. And it is for these reasons we are to worship the Lord at his holy hill in Jerusalem. The Lord God of Israel is described as the avenger of evil deeds, yet he is merciful and forgave his people. The Lord desires mercy and provides a time for us to repent from our sin and turn from our evil ways. Lord, please help us to recognize sin in our lives and to repent and to turn from our evil ways. Amen. Okay, so that concludes the psalm study. Let me close with a word of prayer, and then I'll open the mic for comments. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies each day. Please forgive us and have mercy, mercy for we are a sinful people. We truly do seek to serve you all the days of our life. Lord, help us to have the strength to stand for truth and life and have faith in Yeshua and a devotion to your word each day. We thank you, Lord, for your continued faithfulness to your promises and to us. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the faith to believe in Yeshua the Messiah and for always calling our hearts back to you. Please have mercy on us, forgive us of our sins, help us to grow in our faith, to walk in the Spirit, and to apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name, and we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay.